What is happening, y'all? Cowboy here, and welcome to my sorcery build, the Ice Switch. Now, sorcery builds, as in previous Souls games, are just as ridiculously powerful here, if not more powerful due to some very, very unique interactions with the Flask of Wondrous Physic. Uh, but while this build is capable of putting out just absolutely insane amounts of damage, it is definitely a very squishy build, and it's a play style that, while you can melt the entire world, if something sneezes on you, you're probably going to die. Uh, either way, let's jump on into it, and the first thing I want to talk about are the stats. Now, because I wanted to go all the way up to the soft cap of intelligence at 80, we actually ended up sacrificing a bit of strength here, so we're only at 40 vigor. Uh, 40 vigor is the very first soft cap, it's where you start to see your diminishing returns, but vigor does go all the way up to 60 now, and that has been confirmed. Uh, going past 60, you'll see very minimal returns. So when it comes to Vigor, 40 or 60 are the two points you should really be aiming for, which most of my builds have been 50, so I'm like, eh, not bad. Uh, mind we have up to 36, which gives us 196 FP. The amount of mind you use, you're really going to have to just feel out for, you know, see how much you feel you need for casting. I feel that close to 200 FP feels healthy. Endurance we have at 20. Personally, I don't like going any lower than that. Uh, we could just for, uh, for equipment load concerns, but... At 20, I feel like that's the bare minimum for me to be comfortable with rolling and attacking. Strength, we have at 12 for weapon requirements. Dex, we have at 18 for weapon requirements. And as I mentioned, intelligence is all the way up to 80. So at this point, uh, the soft caps have been determined. People have done the math. Uh, just to point a couple out, Vigor is up at 60. Our damage stats, strength, dex, intelligence, faith, those can all go up to 80 now. Uh, strength in particular actually has like a hidden limit break where you can get strength past 100 when you're two-handing it. You, you go past the 99, which is new. Um, actually, it might have been Dark Souls 3 as well. But anyway, beyond the point. Uh, so yeah, intelligence is going all the way to 80. We are going pure nuke with this build. Uh, Faith and Arcane are both left at base. Of course, this is the same character as before, so it started as Confessor, which is why I have 14 Faith. Uh, but to be honest, that's like, it, it's very unideal. But, um, you know my actual int character won't be this level for quite some time. And unless y'all feel like waiting like a month for a build video, I figured, you know, let's just do it. I'll take the hit to faith. Uh, but anyway, yeah, obviously a faith character doing a sorcery build is less than ideal, but we made it work. Um, all those other points though, I would have probably put them into vigor. Uh, either way though, moving on into the equipment and the first weapon needs no introduction. It is the Moon Veil Katana. Uh, now to be honest, this thing is probably going to get a nerf, but for int builds, this is, it's like your bread and butter right now. I mean, you need 12 strength, 18 dex to wield it, but we get B scaling and int out of this, so it gets pretty high up there at 656. Probably the best thing about this is going to be its weapon art, Transient Moonlight. You sheet the katana, and then doing a light attack will do a wave. Doing a heavy attack will do a vertical wave. Uh, it's just very fast, you know, you can hit something, sheath and throw it out. So this is quick. You've probably seen this thing a lot in PvP. Uh, and to be honest, it's just a solid go-to choice just to have a weapon as a mage. Um, like I said, I have expectations that this will probably get nerfed, but, I mean, until it is, we're using it. Uh, now our second is something that I like a lot, and this is a unique weapon called the Wing of Estelle. Now this, uh, I believe this is down in, in Nokron or somewhere, the Eternal City. Uh, but not too bad, the damage isn't as high at 566, but it is a curved sword. So, you know, nice quick attacks. One of the things I really like about this is that the heavy attacks send out a little wave. So it just gives you like an innate range. And as you can see, this doesn't cost any FP. So that's really nice. Uh, going into the weapon art, a little long to get out, but those explosions can multi-hit. So definitely a really cool weapon all around. And I like it as a good offhander just because of the ranged attack nature of it. Uh, of course, we also have the iconic weapon, the Dark Moon Greatsword. Now, while we don't have the 16 strength, if you're at the breakpoint of 12, which we need for Moonveil, we can still two-hand it. And Dark Moon is still good. You know, obviously, you enchant it. Uh, our heavy attacks are going to do these beams. Those heavy attacks can also be charged to do an even stronger beam. And Dark Moon is great. I mean, we're getting Frost buildup on it. We're getting physical magic. As you can see, we're up to 778 when two-handing this, and it's not even fully upgraded. Uh, but to be honest, this particular build, going all the way up to 80 intelligence and only having 28 poise, uh, trying to use the Dark Moon Greatsword is probably going to get me bopped. This build is not meant to trade whatsoever. Uh, I am not tanky, so I have it, but personally with this setup, I would not recommend using it. Uh, another one I want to give a shout out to is the Bastard Stars, and this is a, a boss weapon from Estelle. In general, I'm not going to be detailing where to get every single item 
uh, moving forward on these videos. You know, there's there's a lot of information out there now. The the various wiki sites are beginning to fill up with where you find stuff. Um, so we're, we're going to save time. I'm not going to go through the map and point out where you find everything, unless it's something that's still kind of rare. Uh, but Bastard Stars is, is pretty interesting. This is definitely more of like a battle mage type thing. You need 22 decks for it. And it gives you like a one-handed flail style attack where you can whip stuff. Um, let me see if I have it just to show off the weapon art. Where are we at? Dex, 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 dex. There we go. So the weapon art's kind of interesting. You do this build up and then throw out and it does a bunch of little explosions. So it's very similar to what we were getting with uh, the Wings of Estelle, but it just hits harder. I don't think it works with this build. Uh, in a similar fashion to the the Dark Moon, this is more of like a, a true battle mage spell sword, like you're, you know, you're in the fray whacking stuff. Uh, this is a caster build through and through. Speaking of casting, let's talk about our staff. Now there are three main staffs I wanna point out. The first being the Carrion Regal Scepter. In my opinion, this is the best staff in the game. Uh, we get 373 arcane scaling when it's up at plus 10. It requires 60 int to use, which isn't a problem since we're going to 80. But all around, this is the best staff by far. Um, now, the Lusat's Glintstone staff, when leveled up, will have more sorcery scaling than the Carry and Regal Scepter. However, this will consume additional FP to enhance the power of sorceries, and it is not worth it. Uh, in my testing, it's roughly a 10% increase. If you consider the additional sorcery scaling that it's going to have over the Carrion Regal Scepter, you're looking at roughly a 13% increase in damage for a 50% increase in your FP costs, which especially in terms of progression and whatnot, that's just, it's simply not usable. You know, 50% increase cost for 13 damage, that's going to be a big no thanks for me. Uh, now, the one thing I want to point out is... With the Flask of Wondrous Physic, we can get the Cerulean Hidden Tear, which will eliminate all FP consumption for roughly 10 seconds. While that is active, it may be worth using loose sets because you have a 10 second window where you're just gonna be able to nuke and it doesn't matter about the FP consumption. But to be honest, popping this and then switching to loose sets and then using a spell and then switching back to another staff, that's, <laughs> that's just a pain in the ass. It's a pain in the ass, so I'm not worried about it. If you really wanna be Mega Glass Cannony, that would be your choice. We also have the Azure Glintstone Staff. Now this one uh, will also cost more. This will cost roughly, I believe it was 25% additional FP in my testing. Uh, but the reduced casting time is very minimal. I casted a spell with, with this, with this, with this, and actually broke down the frame data. Uh, and I calculated a 8% faster cast speed with the Glintstone Staff, which an 8% faster cast is like less than a fraction of a second. So ultimately, just really not worth it, especially when you consider the additional FP cost. All around, carrying a Regal Scepter is going to be the—it's going to be your go-to. Uh, this also boosts the Full Moon Sorcery, which will give us an additional 10% damage on our Full Moons, which is nice. And then lastly, just because we are squishy, I have a shield, carrying Knight Shield. Pretty nice choice here. Has a decent guard boost when leveled up, 100% physical, and I've put Golden Parry on it just because that way, if I really need to get off a of parry, this allows me to do it from a little farther back. Uh, from range being able to do that safely now as for our fashion this one's actually kind of important the snow witch hat the snow witch hat is going to boost the damage of our cold sorceries and we have three different cold spells on this particular lineup uh, in general in my testing i found it to be around a 10 percent boost so that's pretty solid and there are a couple different helms that can be okay this one gives you int uh, this one is going to give you some more mind but at the detriment to your stamina and a lot of these are going to be detrimental in some way you know, this this one is going to detriment your FP. This one's going to detriment stamina, detriment HP and stamina. Whereas this is just a straight 10% boost. Uh, and also, it obviously looks really good. The fashion on the Snow Witch is fantastic. So, of course, we've gone with the Snow Witch robe. Uh, I went for the Nox Monk Bracers. And in general, if you take heavier gloves, it starts to do this. So, you know, at first I was like, all right, I need some poise. But then I look like that. And we don't do that shit here, right? This is a fashion game, first and foremost. So with the fashion game oh actually white reed gauntlets they seem a little bit higher okay yeah go for the white reed gauntlets you just want something that you can wear that will go underneath the robes uh that's the most important part what about Zamor? will they oh Zamor will go too Ooh. just spent more time looking at looking at the various gloves okay so Zamor it is it's gonna give us a whopping three poise but this is probably the highest defense we can get while maintaining our fashion and then under the legs we went for super chungus 
we're going for the the fire prelate greaves here if you don't have those go for lionel's greaves you know you can't see it under the robe so this is this is where you can be sneaky and, and fit a little bit of poison into the build which isn't bad 30 poise it's not a ton but you know it'll get us by uh, moving on to our talismans earth tree favor plus two to be honest, a lot of people haven't been going for the Erdtree's favor anymore, but it's just a solid choice, and especially because we have lower HP and stamina, uh, I think it is worth more than normal. As you can see on the stat difference, I'm getting an extra 58 health from this. Uh, I'm getting a, what, extra 10 stamina from it. I'm getting, well, I'm going into a heavy equipment load if I take it off. But so it, it's going to help here because we are really bare minimums uh, on, on our other stats. Besides that, green turtle, because I have low stamina, I want to make sure that I have that ability to dodge around. Graven mass talisman, this is going to be a pretty nice boost around, uh, hang on a second, let me check. I was running these numbers with, with Tox the other day. Uh, do, 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 do. No, I can't find it. I know, I want to say it's like an 8% or a 10% flat boost to sorcery damage. Uh, and then our last one, which we had just swapped off of, of course, is going to be the Radigan Icon, just to shorten the spell casting time. Now, in general, um, two big casting ones, of course, is the Godfrey Icon and the Radigan Icon. And the big deciding factor is whether you're charging spell or whether you are just doing quick casts. And one thing I want to point out is that not every spell can be charged and a lot of spells in particular they they can actually be like held to cast but i don't believe that picks up the, the charging bonus so you can see right here no mention of charging this can be cast repeatedly but no mention of charging this one has charging that's what you need charging enhances potency so unless your spell you know this is hold to continue releasing power charging enhances potency can be cast in motion uh cast in motion so for us shard spiral and Loretta's Great Bow are the only things that would really benefit from from picking up that, uh, going for the Godfrey Icon here. And that's a big thing. If you're going to use this, uh, use either that or use this, the biggest determining factor is going to be whether or not you have more quick casts or whether you have spells that you're going to charge. Uh, kind of on that note, because I know I had them both on the Faith build, I've since found the Phlox Canvas Talisman. I would slot that in into the Faith build as well. I'll have an updated build video discussing that uh, a little bit down the line. Uh, moving on from there, though, probably the most important thing is going to be the Flask of Wondrous Physic. We're going to combo the Magic Shrouding Cracked Tier and the Cerulean Hidden Tier, and this is going to eliminate all FP consumption for about 10 seconds, uh, while also giving us a magic boost that I believe was another 10% damage boost, or, or possibly even more than that. It might have been 15 to 20. Uh, but either way, when we pop this, we melt things. Now, just to point out those two tiers in particular, because that is kind of a, a specific part of the build, uh, the first from the Road of Iniquity, you just head east, and then right by this dead Erd tree, you'll find a thing to fight. The other one is here from the Mausoleum Compound. You go up and you, you uh, right here, the Minor Erd tree. You go around this little cliff to the Minor Erd tree, and that's where you'll get the other one. Uh, so, let's talk about our spells, because there's a lot to go into with our spell breakdown. Uh, now, in general, real fast, just to go through, because I know people are going to be asking for early spells, I'd recommend Carrion Slicer, Rock Throw, and Glintstone Arc. For your mid-game, I'd recommend getting Glintstone Ice Crag, Loretta's Great Bow, and Night Maiden's Mist. And then into the late game, either Renala or Ronnie's Moon, Comet Azure, Adula's Moonblade, and Shard Spiral. For PvP in particular, I really like the Stars of Ruin and the Cannon of Hama. Moving on to our particular spell loadout though, and this is my general go-to for almost all the PvE content. First up, Ronnie's Dark Moon. Now, you'll actually get more damage out of Renala's Full Moon, but Ronnie's Dark Moon will cause a massive amount of bleed buildup. Now, both of these spells have a unique effect of causing the target to take more magic damage, 10% uh, in fact. But what's interesting is this will stack with Frostbite. So if you get Frostbite on the target, you're getting that 10%, and then you're getting the 20% additional damage the target takes when Frostbitten. So because of that, I prefer Ronnie's Moon, even though it does cost more and it does a little bit less damage. Uh, in my testing, and this was mostly done against the Trolls in the Starter Zone, I could do one Ronnie Dark Moon, and then I could follow that up with a single Glintstone Ice Crag, and that was enough to proc Frostbite on those targets. If I was using Glintstone Ice Crag on its own, it took up to five to be able to proc Frostbite on the target. So that's a lot of buildup that's going to be going out. Um, if you have a weapon that already has Frostbite and you're sure you can get it off easily, then I think Renala's Full Moon is going to be a superior choice. But if you're trying to open and get that Frostbite on fast, Dark Moon is great. 
Moving on from there though, Glintstone Ice Crag. This is our daily driver. This thing has a 12 FP cost. It has very, very solid damage for that cost. It can proc Frostbite. All in all, just a solid basic use sorcery spell. Next up, we have Shard Spiral. Uh, now this, you have to go all the way through uh, the Mage Lady's quest line, the one that's in Waypoint Ruins. But this, I consider it to be like an upgrade to, uh, to Glintstone Arc. This is going to be a multi-hit attack. So it's really good on bigger targets. It can go through and hit multiple times as it's spiraling. Uh, and it's also pretty low cost at 16. So if a bunch of enemies are coming after you and you can kind of back up and group them into a hallway, this can very easily decimate them all. Moving on down the list, Adula's Moonblade. This is by far and wide uh, the best sword spell in the game. This can do a multi-hit. So as opposed to the other swords, this can hit up to three times. It can also do Frostbite. It also has a projectile that comes after it. Very, very good value spell. Next up is Night Maiden's Mist. Now, this is a bit of a tricky spell. It's going to put a mist out. Once the mist reaches the target, it's going to spread. It's going to stay on the target. Uh, this is very similar to Pestilent Mist from Dark Souls 3. So this will do a lot of damage. For that measly 20 FP, I can do almost 2,000 damage with this if the target stays in the cast. So this is kind of a fire and forget thing. That mist can also damage you as well, which is definitely something to be aware of. Uh, but this is fantastic on the bigger bosses or things where you're just trying to kind of cheese them and you know throw out the mist and not worry about them. Loretta's Great Bow. Now you could use either this or Loretta's Mastery. I really like having this as a sniping option, similar to how I had a Frenzy Burst on the, the Faith build to snipe off things that are in the distance or birds or whatever the case is. That's what Loretta's Great Bow does for me here. It has a higher FP cost to damage, but because of the fact that I can cast this at max range, it's definitely a, a solid value pick for progressing through the game. And last but not least, oh baby, Comet Azure. This thing is a massive Dragon Ball Z Kamehameha. You throw this out and you will nuke whatever you are hitting. Now, we have two primary nukes. We have Comet Azure and we have Meteorite of Estelle. Meteorite of Estelle is absolutely terrible value in terms of damage to FP cost. However, if you have that flask active, the one that eliminates FP costs, you can do some serious damage with Meteorite of Estelle. You can also do some serious damage with Comet Azure because we can just hold down the cast button and continue to fire it out. What it's going to come down to is the type of boss you're fighting. If you're fighting something where you think it'll be distracted by your summon and it's going to stay in place for maybe five seconds, Comet Azure is going to be your nuke. If you're fighting something that likes to jump around and run all over the place, Meteorite of Estelle is going to be your nuke. So go between these two spells depending on what you are up against. Uh, now to talk about some alterations here. Terra Magicus, this is going to put down a sigil on the ground that does a big boost to your magic damage. Uh, and it, it's nice, but it adds another level of situational kind of conditions to this build. And this build already nukes. Um, when we put this down, it's going to create a sigil. We need to stay in that sigil. It's not super small. I can, I can show it real fast. But in general, you know, we're already so squishy. The idea of like, okay, I need to stay in this little circle. That doesn't really appeal to me. Now, there are particular situations such as dragons and world bosses where if you're fighting something and you know for a fact you can get that off and nuke it before it can do anything, that might be worthwhile. Uh, but outside of those, those very specific circumstances, in general, it's going to be kind of risky for you to get that off. Uh, moving on from there, Cannon of Haima. I really like this thing for PvP. Uh, this is going to do... Well, let, let's go through some of the moves real fast before before I talk about the alternates. Uh, so, Ronnie's Dark Moon. This one is a, a large build-up. You're going to float up in the sky. And it's going to start off slow, and then it's going to zip off and hit your target. It's going to also do an explosion. Glintstone Ice Crag, cast repeatedly. Like I said, this is our, our daily driver here. This thing is getting lots of damage and causing frostbite. Shard Spiral. You can see each of those twists is going to be a hit. So really good damage on your bigger bosses. A Duelist Moonblade. You can cast that multiple times if you don't run out of FP. Night Maiden's Mist. I think I need to target something for y'all to really see this. Well, let's just cast it out. So you're gonna see there's like a little mist and when it hits the point, it's going to create the Silver Mist, which will deal damage. Uh, Loretta's Great Bow. As I mentioned, you can snipe distances. Like as soon as you can lock on, you can hit something with that. And then Comet Azure. Ah! Which if you just hold down the button, that keeps casting. 
so now let's talk about those those alternate spells now that we've we've shown off our main spells definitely a longer a longer build guide trying to fit all of this information in uh we'll just take off a couple here so cannon we already showed that put on that put on that put on it's so other stuff uh the cannon of Haima. i like this for pvp uh, for kind of invasions. The thing is when you throw this out, it's going to be a big explosion. It's a very large AoE, so if you can catch people, like choke point them in a doorway or whatnot, you have a lot of potential there to hit people. You know, you're throwing this out, it's just, it's very large. You're covering a lot of area with it. Uh, Stars of Ruin, this is a fantastic chase spell. The damage to FP ratio isn't too high, but this will hunt people down. As you can see, the range isn't all that good. Uh, but this is a good, you know, people are running from you, throw that out. We have Founding Rain of Stars, which Founding Rain isn't too bad. Um, I mean, it's kind of cool, but, to, you know, looking at the range on that, honestly, I think Night Maiden's Mist is just a better spell. It's also going to last longer. And then we have Meteorite of Estelle, which you can hold down to continue to cast. It's just going to keep summoning out. It's going to keep summoning out those meteors, but you can see how fast that drained my bar. Uh, and that's why, in general, I don't like recommending it unless we have our flask up. But we'll, we'll show uh, bosses under both of those conditions. So that is, that's the breakdown. Um, these are my preferred spells. Obviously, you know, you don't have to use exactly what I'm using. If the, one of the benefits of playing a mage is, you know, play, play with whatever you want. Test out different stuff, see what you, you find yourself liking. Uh, you know, these are just my general spell picks, some alternates and some stuff for PvP, but there are a ton of different spells in this game. You know, there's going going over just to talk about a few alternates. Um, you know, this is a, a good early version of, of our chase, Glintstone Arc, super good early on. If you want to play a battle mage, Gavel of Hyma is really good. You have enchant stuff here, you can deflect spells over here. Uh, Carrion Phallix is pretty decent. This this is a better value than Great Blade Phallix. Of course, Loretta's Mastery will, will do multiple arrows that you can shoot on out. Um, you know, we can do this to just spell spells and then do Glint Blades ourselves, or we can do this to draw spells. Uh, we have the Lava stuff, which also needs Faith, so we're not really working into that here. We have Freezing Mist. We have regular Meteorite, which is inferior to Estelle. We have the Blood stuff. The bubbles are actually really good. The Oracle Bubbles, this is like a little shotgun. You can hit it from, from like a very close range or like a more mediumish range, but this does really solid damage. Uh, if you want to split split into faith, you can pick up the death stuff, but that's a that's a whole separate build, to be honest. But, you know, there's a lot of variety in sorcery this time around, and it's definitely a lot of fun. So I've been talking long enough. Let me wrap things up here, and I'm going to do a boss montage of me just melting stuff. This dude, I remember him from the strength build video. See that glass cannon nature. I 
Next, we got a death bird. See if something moves out of the way of your comet, that's where you're going to struggle a little bit. That's exactly why we usually use Meteor as an alternative on dudes that move a lot. Let's fight through White Ridge Road a little bit. This will just kind of give you an idea of uh, how this works with like general progression. You know, getting through fighting enemies, how well you manage your FP, stuff like that. Now most of the stuff we fought has been targets that either we can have a summon with us or they're things that are going to be starting standing still. So wanted to fight something where we can't bring anyone else along. Um, you know, you kind of saw that we struggled a little bit more against Vike. On the note of summons briefly, Mimic is still great, uh, but your Mimic is going to be squishy like you. So besides him, I think the Ancient Dragon Knight and uh, Tish are your two best ones. Tish is squishy, but he's very evasive. So he can kind of move and juke a lot. Uh, and Dragonite has a great shield, so obviously he holds his own just fine. You can see with the shield. And this is where you're going to start to struggle a little bit with like a more mage build. see the problem with mist if we can keep him in it yeah and this is why when people are like oh well casters are just easy mode like i mean yeah we can melt certain bosses but then there's things like this dude where it's just 
trip to the struggle bus, you know? So that's going to wrap things up for this one. Before we close out, I briefly do want to go through some other spells. Uh, I talked about these at the start, but I know a lot of people are always like, hey, how do I make this at an earlier level? Uh, so just some, some early stuff. At the beginning of the game, Glintstone Arc, this is going to be like one of your bread and butter spells. Great AoE, great clear. Uh, can't go wrong with this. Uh, Comet or Glintstone Comet Shard, both of these are pretty decent when you get them. They're obviously not as cost effective as Arc, uh, but they, they give you a decent range damage option. If you really want to do one of the Phallaxes, I would suggest the Carrion Phallax. You get this one a little bit later, but it's better than Great Blade and better than the regular one. Uh, Magic Downpour, also a decent earlier spell that you can get, and probably one of the most surprising, which I don't see, uh, but Carrion Slicer. It's the little sword you can pick up super early. In terms of just the damage output to the FP, it's actually the most cost effective spell in the entire game. Uh, it can, can tear through bosses, but it's definitely more of a spell blade thing because you're in melee range. Uh, besides that, the the uh, this stuff is, is more situational. I wouldn't suggest trying to use it for damage. And then both the magma and the death stuff, that's more for hybridized builds. And since you're going to need to invest in faith, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, the, the crystal sorceries didn't feel they were all that good. Uh, as for the gravity sorceries, we showed off the, the meteorite. But rock sling early on is super good. And in particular, can cause a ton of stagger, opening enemies up to critical. Uh, the last thing is the Oracle Bubbles. I know they seem like a joke spell, but these are actually really, really hard hitting for a low FP cost. With this build, these do close to 1,000 damage, uh, and you can either use it from like a close to mid-range or right up on top of a target like a shotgun. Of course, they do require some arcane scaling. Uh, so that's going to wrap things up for this build. Definitely a really fun playstyle, even if it is a bit squishy. Uh, but moving on from here, we are going to have the dex build as per the poll on the channel. Um, you know, I'm working, obviously, with the sorcery build on all the walkthrough preps, so this was more I, I needed to know what spells I wanted to go for on that, uh, just so we can get the walkthrough out faster for y'all. But we're closing this one on out. Dex is coming next, and I'll see y'all then.